NIRACUS, which stands for the Northeastern Regional Association of Coastal Ocean Observing Systems. It's a long acronym. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll, I have it spelled out a little bit. You can see, maybe I hope you can see from my, I kind of stole my title from um, Wizard of Oz. Probably remember Lions and Tigers and Bears, oh my. Mine is Nor'easters, Media Tsunamis, and Marine Heat Waves, oh my. Doesn't quite roll off your tongue the same way, but I think you get the drift. Um, so I'm going to talk about some marine phenomena that we experience here in the Northeast. And uh, also talk about how NIRACUS is uh, monitoring you know, the ocean and collecting this data and, and helping uh, scientists and forecasters use this data. And uh, weather has been in the headlines uh, today. This is from the Washington Post. Probably if you looked at any newspaper in Europe, you would see something about this as a major heat wave in Europe. Uh, Paris was expected to be 108 degrees Fahrenheit today. Um, more locally, uh, from the Boston Globe, they kind of had a similar headline, Tornado Sharks Brutal Heat Wave. It's Hell Week on Cape Cod. Uh, so, I, I think we're fortunate to be here in Maine and not in, in Europe right now, or down on Cape Cod. Uh, but I'm glad you, uh, you guys uh, came out tonight to, uh, to listen to me. So, like I said, the first thing I want to do is just give a quick overview about Miracruz, the organization I work for and what we did. So again, it's the Northeastern Regional Association of Coastal Ocean Observing Systems. We're a federal, federally funded program, so we get our money from NOAA, so your tax money is, uh, is making the system work. Our mission is to produce, integrate, and communicate high quality information that helps ensure safety, economic and environmental resilience, and sustainable use of the coastal ocean. Basically, we want, to, we want to collect ocean data and get it into the hands of people that need it, whether it's uh, the Coast Guard who's on a rescue mission or a fisherman trying to make a decision if he or she wants to go out to work, or a surfer trying to see if the waves are good. This map shows the region that we work in, we're in the Northeast region. And we have sister programs all around the United States that do similar work as us. And the idea to have a regional program is that you can have people in the region uh, talking to the stakeholders, the people that need the data in the region, to really understand what data they need and how they want to look at the data. So, ocean observing is <coughs> what we do, and you've started to hear some of the discussion of how we do it. The real sort of backbone workforce of our system is this system oceanographic buoys. You can see this map here. All the red um, dots are the near cruise buoys that we maintain. The yellow ones are the National Data Buoy Center buoys. Um, and so you can see they're spread out uh, through the Gulf of Maine. And these buoys are, some of the buoys, some of our buoys have been out there since 2001. So now we have over 18 years worth of data, hourly data, so they're collecting data every hour. Some measurements are made more frequently, uh, but we've really built up a long record of, of data for the Gulf of Maine. You can see on the surface here uh, a wind sensor, there's also temperature sensor, uh, humidity sensor, uh, visibility sensor on the buoy. You can see these uh, solar panels that charge the batteries that run all the electronics and computers on the buoy. And the things that make our buoys unique, say compared to the National Weather Service buoys, is you can see this string of instruments uh, down the mooring line here. So we have instruments that go throughout the water column measuring temperature, salinity, dissolved oxygen, um, chlorophyll, which the amount of uh, plant life in the water. Also, some sensors on some movies that measure dissolved, ice, dissolved oxygen and nutrients. And so we can really track and see what's going on in the, the different layers of the ocean. There's also sensors on there that measures the speed and direction of the currents uh, throughout the water column. And again, it's really, I'm really impressed with the the way these buoys work. It's a real harsh environment. You'll see some, some data uh, showing that, but for the most part, these buoys are out there sending back data 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. We occasionally lose one, and I'm going to tell you a little story about that, I think, next. Um, so one of our buoys, buoy N, way out here in the Northeast Channel. Now, the Northeast Channel is a really important location to monitor. It's a deep channel. It's where um, there's different sources of deep water that can come into the Gulf of Maine, and they come in through that northeast channel. 
So it's a really important place to monitor and see what water is coming into the Gulf of Maine. That can really change the, the composition of the water in the Gulf of Maine and affect, affect the whole ecosystem. Um, it's a pretty rough environment out there. Um, and in 2014, uh, the buoy was out there, the mooring line broke, we're not sure what happened, and it started to drift out into the uh, North Atlantic Ocean. We couldn't get a vessel to go after it. Uh, and it kept drifting. I want to orient you a little bit to this map now. So here's Cape Cod, and here we are up in Maine, Nova Scotia, Delaware Bay, the Bahamas. So in 2014, it started drifting. Now, again, the, the buoy, are sort of smart buoys. They know where they're supposed to be, and when they're not where they're supposed to be, they say, hey, I'm not where I'm supposed to be, and here's where I am. So the buoy kept reporting its um, location. And you can see it just drifted around the North Atlantic Ocean, the currents moving in different places. Uh, the Neil and his group at the University of Maine thought that the batteries on some of the sensors would die after a year, but actually some of them lasted the whole time I was out there, three years, they just kept collecting data. They kept tracking it, and occasionally they try to see if there's a ship nearby, but it, you know nobody could pick it up. And eventually, you know, over three years, it wound its way around the North Atlantic and got close to Bermuda. And so um, Neil was able to go down to the Bermuda and Bermuda, Bermuda Biological Station had a vessel, and they went and picked it up and brought it back. It's back at the University of Maine now. They were able to recover the data. Okay, it was still um, yeah, it's still working. So, and, and that was that was accidental. Um, but based on that, he actually wants to purposefully release a buoy out in the North Atlantic Ocean, and just have it drift, drift around and collect data. So, fortunately, we got that uh, we got that buoy back. In addition to the buoys, as I mentioned, we're now deploying ocean drones or these gliders. You can see it sort of looks like a torpedo with wings. Um, and these these gliders they change their buoyancy, and so what they'll for movement they'll change their buoyancy and they'll dive down in the water column, then come back up all the time. They have collecting data. They have sensors on them again, measuring water temperature, salinity, chlorophyll. Actually, this um, glider was had a special acoustic device. It was listening for whale vocalization, so it could detect where there were whales, and. Uh, they put them out there, they're remotely operated. Somebody back in the lab can direct it and tell it where to go. And here's a recent mission of one of the gliders that was launched off of Cutler, Maine in December of 2018. And you can see it's making its way down along the Maine coast, off the coast of New Hampshire, Massachusetts, and then its mission ended off of Cape Cod, where it was recovered in April uh, this year. All the time collecting data. Every time it surfaced, it would send the data back. Um, so these gliders are really great because what they allow us to do is fill in in between the buoys. So the buoys are really important. You have one location where you're collecting data for a long period of time, but you don't necessarily know what's happening in between the buoys. So you can send these gliders out to collect that data. Or if there's an event like a harmful algal bloom or an oil spill where there isn't a buoy but you want to collect data, you can send one of these drones out to collect data for that. So that's a, another way we collect uh, data. The buoy data, the, um, the data from these drones and other sources of data, still really, um, we're still just, there's lots of big gaps where we're, we don't have any data, we don't know what's going on. So we also support um, oceanographic modeling or ocean forecasts. So, so these are uh, computer models, that are run on supercomputers that can forecast the ocean conditions three to five days in the future, forecasting you know, weather, winds, waves, water temperature, salinity, the currents. Um, and this is a grid of one of these models. And these models use the buoy data and the glider data. Uh, you, you really need those observations for the models to, to validate that the models are working. Um, and then we can create forecasts you know, like this, um, that's showing, there's a visualization of the forecast of ocean temperature in that region. And we could have an image of this for every hour for the next three to five days. And so this will help, help fishermen, uh, weather service forecasters kind of understand what's going on out in the ocean. And these forecasts can also kind of help us understand where we might need to put other buoys to get information. So it 
the, the observations from the buoys and the gliders and the models all sort of work complementary for the ocean observing system. So is the red heat? Yeah, so in this... The, the, it seems like it's the wrong other way around. You, you expect the heat coming from the land and the... So yeah, the, the, there's no, not showing any heat on the land, we're just showing ocean temperature. And this, what you're seeing right here, this feature is the Gulf Stream. So it's really okay. warm water that's coming up out of the Gulf of Mexico along the coast and that turns off. So it's very warm water. That's what keeps um, the UK um, um, climate warmer. So uh, warm water comes up there. And this is colder water in the Gulf of Maine. And you can see some of the warmer water getting in. We're just going to talk about that a little later. But yeah, so that's, that is much, that's much warmer water from the Gulf Stream. We have <coughs> colder water, colder water coming down um, into the Gulf of Maine from Canada. But yeah, please, please go ahead and ask any questions. I'm happy to answer them as we go along. So, but ultimately, what we want to do is get this information, the observations, and forecasts out in a way that people can use them. So here's we have a website www.nearcoops.org. All this information is free, publicly available. Here's an example of a map where you can click on buoy. This is buoy F, which is in Penobscot Bay, just off Bottles Head. It was data from uh, yesterday at 5 p.m. You can see the wind speed was eight knots. The wind direction was out of the southwest. Wave period, the distance between the peaks and the waves was about seven seconds. Air temperature was 60 to 4 degrees, and the water temperature was up. A balmy 50 degrees, and visibility was 1.6 miles. So this is really important information we hear from fishermen that the first thing they do in the morning, after they get their cup of coffee, they get out of their computer, their phone, and they'll, they'll check this date, check out the buoy data that's near them to see if uh, it's safe for them to go out um, fishing. So that's, again, that's really the, uh, the end game for us, is to make sure that this information that we collect is getting into the hands of uh, people that can um, and so at this point, now what I want to do is switch over and talk about <coughs> the marine weather experience here in the Gulf of Maine and show you some data um, that NIRCU's collected that's uh, relevant to those phenomena. And the first thing I want to talk about is the Patriot's Day storm uh, from April 2007. Do, do it. you remember that storm from... Yeah, it was a, it was a pretty big storm, very powerful nor'easter. Um, in Portland, we had the seventh highest tide on record. It was higher than the perfect storm. Uh, the real impact from this storm, damaging impact, is that over six consecutive high tide cycles, uh, there was coastal flooding and coastal impacts. There were 30-foot waves measured, and I'll show you that from one of our movies. There was extreme freshwater runoff, eight inches of rain, and uh, over $264 million in damages. I remember this storm pretty well because I had an office, I was working at the Gulf of Maine Research Institute, which is in Portland, Maine. It's on Commercial Street, and that's right on the water. And so this, my office building looked out into Portland Harbor, which is typically pretty tranquil, flat water, you know, a lot of boats out there. But I wanted to work on Patriot's Day to, to get a little work done. And this is what I saw outside. That's right in Portland Harbor, really rough. I think probably at 10, 30 or 11 o'clock, somebody came in the building and said, you guys need to leave the building because they thought the parking lot behind the building next to the water was going to flood. I remember coming downstairs in the building and there are two there are doors that look out to the water and the, the wind was driving the rain you know, through the seams in the door. <laughs> There's water coming in. And so, so I went home. It took me a while to get home because there was flooding nearby and I got diverted. Um, but uh, this is a, um, a surface map from the Patriot State Storm, and this was given to me by a colleague at the National Weather Service. Um, and what he told me was that this storm retrograded, and which he said means it kind of backed into New England. In that case, that's a, a bad scenario because it can, it can end up building, you know, bringing more waves into the coast. And uh, you can see some of these you know, really strong hurricane force winds coming into the coast. And here's some satellite imagery 
that he also gave me. You can see, here's Florida, Cape Cod is Maine. You can see how big the swarm was. This is water vapor. So there's a lot of really warm water uh, in the atmosphere energizing that storm. This is just visible satellite imagery, so you can see how big and extensive that storm, that Patriot State storm was. Uh, this one is radar reflectivity, uh, showing that the storm was again backing in. I think there's Long Island Sound kind of backed in over Long Island Sound. This is uh, another instru instrument they use from the National Weather Service showing wind speed. Um, and he said that the highlight here was, you know, over you know, 16 knot winds here along the coast of Maine. So, you know, hurricane force type winds that were really thrashing the coast. Uh, next, I think I'm going to show you some buoy data from some of our buoys from this storm. So, this is from Buoy B, which is here off of southern Maine. And for this graph, the dates are on the bottom here, April 15, 16, 17. And this is a graph of atmospheric pressure measured by the buoy. And so as you can see, as you get to the Patriot's Day, the pressure really drops that buoy down to 985 millibars. Uh, he said that the, uh, the lowest pressure that was measured for this storm, I think, was 968, which he says is typical of a Category 2 hurricane, the pressure of a Category 2 hurricane. So a really low pressure. And then the wind. So these are wind gusts from the buoy. Um, again, the dates along here, wind speed and knots. So you can see the wind picking up 10, 20, 30, you know, peaking out at 45 knots, but really consistently over several days, you know, at times blowing above 30 knots. Really strong winds over a long period of time, multiple days. And then with that wind blowing consistently over the Gulf of Maine, you have this buildup of uh, waves. So again, this is the dates, wave height in feet, you can see the waves going 5 feet, 10, 15, 20. And then again, some waves measured out there, 30 foot waves. These are big, really powerful waves. But uh, the real damaging aspect is how, the fact that you know, you've got 15 foot waves almost for, for multiple days over multiple tidal cycles. And that's really when a lot of the damage occurs when you have that high tide and the waves just bashing against the shore. And, um, you know, it causes Portland Harbor to look like this. Uh, there's Portland Headlight in Cape Elizabeth, some pretty dramatic waves there. Uh, downtown Portland, there was significant flooding in downtown Portland. That storm surge pushed in a lot of water, and you have the waves on top of it piling water in. Uh, a lot of wind damage, too, with those uh, near hurricane force winds from the Patriot State storm. A lot of damage at marinas. There's a Coast Guard inspecting a boat that was sunk in one of the marinas. And then just this, I think, really sums it up along the coast. I think this is from, I think this is from the soccer area where you see you know, multiple buildings um, you know, destroyed, roads destroyed, utility lines knocked down. So, again, this is. The, the Patriots Day storm of 2007. I want to just mention one, we, you know, we have nor'easters fairly frequently. Um, one, another one was in 2018, around March 3rd, another storm that came up along the coast with extremely large, uh, long period waves. Uh, long period waves meaning that the, the, the period is the time between um, wave peaks. And you can see again, Data from Buoy B from March of 2018. The wave heights ramping up as the storm comes in. Um, again, multiple days with wave heights over 15 feet. And here you can see this is the wave period, which is in seconds. It's the time between the peaks and the waves. Typically around here, the wave period is four, six, seven, eight seconds. But you know, with this storm, we're seeing the wave periods. Uh, 16 seconds. I heard from an emergency manager, you know, in Southern Maine saying this is the, the boulders are going into the road tide. And um, sure enough, <laughs> there's a picture of the, you know, boulders, rocks getting uh, washed into the road. So, um, you know, these are events that um, the Northeast experiences um, fairly regularly. 
Um, it can be especially damaging along the coast. And so the observations that you know near Coos collects helps improve the models, improve the forecasting. Also, the data that we provide can help forecasters, hopefully emergency managers, better prepare and protect lives and property. Yeah. Could you explain a bit? I've never quite understood why the area is so significant. I, I know it's a major parameter, but does that, um, I mean, just having a longer period, does that promote more damage as opposed to the wave height? Yeah, that's a really good question. I'm trying to remember. I think the longer period is more energy in that wave. And I'm going to give you an example of a, a wave that's a really long period. But uh, yeah, so these uh, typically that the longer period, it means that that wave has had uh, longer time to develop, it's traveled over a longer length, um, and it typically has more energy. So as it comes crashing in, there's... I guess if it was a short period wave, it's more likely to break, mm -hmm. that sort of thing, as opposed to a longer period. Okay. So the next, we we'll talk about some waves a little bit more, but I want to talk about some mysterious waves that showed up in Booth Bay Harbor in 2009. And uh, this was a really kind of a unique event. Um, so again, in, in two, October of 2009, some mysterious waves impacted Booth Bay Harbor and some adjacent harbors. Uh, the waves appeared from Cundy's Harbor to Christmas Cove. Waves 8 to 12 feet high reached the coast between 1.30 and 3.30 p.m. The period between these waves was 18 minutes. So one wave came in, and eight, about 18 minutes another wave came in. Um, there was a riptide appearance with white water. Fortunately, this event occurred near low tide, um, so the tide was pretty low. There's a lot of damage to docks and boats. There's no earthquake reported. They were able to measure this on tide gauges. And somebody who was working down the docks in Booth Bay Harbor reported that in 15 minutes, the water rose 12 feet, then it receded, then it happened again. It occurred three times, uh, each time ripping apart docks and splitting wood pilings. I've got a few images um, of, you know, just sort of water rushing in to the harbor. And here's another picture of kind of a riptide appearance. Some of the damage that was done, you can see this was a walkway of a pier just was ripped off. And here you can see some of the damage to the pilings. So a really, really strange event. Um, so the uh, meteorologists and oceanographers uh, started looking at this. And what their um, sort of conclusion was, would probably occurred with what's known as a video tsunami. So it's a tsunami. Um, it's a small weather-driven tsunami caused by changes in air pressure created by a fast-moving or severe thunderstorm. So you have this um, fast-moving storm out over the ocean. The pressure disturbance can um, causes water displacement over open water. This wave can come in in a harbor, like Booth Bay Harbor, can amplify those waves and you have this impact. And so what, what uh, they did, the uh, National Weather Service just tried, looked into this, see if there was evidence for this meteor tsunami. I mean, the waves were obviously there, but they want to see if the meteorological conditions were there. So looking back, um, at the meteorology of the weather for that day. This is a, another image sent to me by the National Weather Service. And this shows a deep upper level trough. And here's uh, the east coast of the United States. Um, and large, fast moving thunderstorms up around Maine, over the Gulf of Maine. So that there were the right conditions for it. Um, Look, they were also looking for pressure, atmospheric pressure changes about that time. And here's some, also, some data from buoy E, which is off of Montegan Island, showing a, a pretty significant pressure drop at about the time that was happening. 
Um, but this happened really quickly, and our buoys were only measuring things every hour. So it would have been better if we were measuring atmospheric pressure every 10 minutes or something. We might have gotten more information. Um, this is a, uh, again, a satellite um, image showing that thunderstorms were forming. Here's, I don't know if you can see, there's the coast of Maine, and these are thunderstorms that are forming and moving pretty rapidly. And so the idea was that these thunderstorms, these storm systems, were moving at the same speed as a deep water wave move in the Gulf of Maine. And that pressure change resulting from these fast moving thunderstorms called that, caused that, you know, that, that uh, bump in the water. I think I have another, yeah, this is another image. And again, you can see, there's the coast of Maine, and you can see these uh, convective bands or rain bands forming out of these fast moving thunderstorms, which um, probably caused that uh, tsunami to occur. And so that was their conclusion that that mysterious wave was probably a you know, medio tsunami you know, caused by these fast moving storms. And there's a recent report um, coming out of NOAA, the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration. Uh, where they figure out that they, these meteor tsunamis have a, a unique signature that can be detected by um, water level gauges along the coast. And so they did a study and they realized that um, they could detect these meteor tsunamis. And looking back at the day, they realized that there are some locations where it's not really frequent, but they can have these meteor tsunamis you know, up to four or six times a year. Um, but for the most part, the wave height of these you know, tsunamis is pretty small, so a lot of times it's just you really don't, you wouldn't notice it, but these water level sensors can detect it. So they happen pretty relatively frequently. For the most part, they're pretty small, um, but that's what they think happened in uh, Blue Bay Harbor in 2009. The next thing I want to talk about are uh, marine heat waves. Um, so. And along with that, the warming of the Gulf of Maine. You, you may have heard um, this, that uh, over the past decade, the sea surface temperature in the Gulf of Maine has increased faster than 99% of the global ocean. So our little area here in the, in the Gulf of Maine is warming faster than 99% of the world's ocean over the, last, over the last 10 years. And there's a, this, oops, sorry, this is. Of any place on Earth? The whole ocean. Yep. Um, and this is a work that was done by Andrew Persian, who's a chief scientist down at the Gulf of Maine Research Institute, looking at satellite data and uh, buoy data. And so, you know, we're familiar with atmospheric heat waves, you know, when it's exceedingly warm for a couple of days, there's a definition for it. But so now there is a definition for what a marine heat wave is. And that's when you have five or more days when the water temperature is above the 90 percentile of what you would expect. And I have a, this graphic to show this again. This is time, water temperature. And you have a, what's called a climatological mean. So you, at a certain location, you've measured that water temperature for, say, 30 years, and you calculate the mean temperature for that location at you know, different times throughout the year. Um, and this is the sort of threshold, the 90th percentile. And this would be your temperature. You would expect it to, I'll show some real data, where it moves up and down, you know, below the mean, above the mean, some, you know, heat spikes. But it's when you, when it gets warmer than the 90th percentile for five days is what's defined as a marine heat wave. And the first heat wave that I want to talk about is one that we experienced in uh, 2012, the Northwest Atlantic heat wave. This data is a little different. We can see the years along here. But on this axis, it's, we're using um, a temperature anomaly. Basically, the temperature anomaly is a difference from an average or baseline temperature. So they've calculated uh, over, you know, they've measured water temperature in the Gulf of Maine with satellites for 30 years, so they can create an average temperature. Um, and if 
the temperature is above the average, that's a positive anomaly. If it's below the average, you have a negative anomaly. And you can see, you know, throughout the 80s and 90s, as you'd expect, some years it's a slightly positive anomaly, some years it's slightly negative, some years it's average, as you'd expect. But around here in 2006-07, the anomalies start to go up. And finally, in 2012, you just had this really, really warm year. And it was the whole Northwest Atlantic, not, not just the Gulf of Maine, but all the way up here, just really warm. And this happened in 2012. Coincidentally, at Miracuse, we had had a fisherman asking us. They knew we had these buoys out there. They were looking at the buoy temperature all the time. They'd occasionally ask us, they'd be like, well, you know, I, can you show me what the water temperature is today and how it compares to the average temperature or the temperature last year? Because they're really always, they're paying attention to what they're catching, that's their livelihood. Anything changes, they want to know what's different out there so they can understand what's going on. So we created this graph, and this is, we have one for each of our buoys. This one is for buoy I, which is off of Mount Desert Island. And again, on the bottom of the months of the year, and this is water temperature. And so this is now 18 years worth of data. The blue line is the average temperature from the 18 years worth of data. This yellow envelope are the daily highs and lows. So it kind of shows you, you would expect, typically, the water temperature, buoy I, you know, it's, it's coldest in March and April, warmest in August, September. But throughout the year, you know, expect the temperature readings, the actual readings, to fluctuate kind of within that envelope. Here's the real data from 2012. So these were the actual readings. They were setting the upper limits of what we've ever measured there. Um, and you can see that it, uh, marine heat wave is defined as five days where you have really warm. It was almost like all many months for the whole year was a marine heat wave. It was just a really, really warm year. Uh, we saw this something really warm again in 2016. Actually, you can see that 2013, 2014, 2015 were relatively warm, but 2016, actually, it was, uh, there were marine heat waves all over. It was a really warm year for the global ocean. Uh, and you can see it. Here's buoy data for buoy I. Again, you know, really warm in the, in the winter, really warm in the fall. Um, so again, it was another marine heat wave year. And, and could you, I assume that, that you could do some kind of correlation with the mean land temperature, you know, so mm -hmm. over the whole state of New England. Yeah, people are definitely looking at the, the atmospheric temperature as well. And I'll, I'll show you a little bit more. Um, and last year, 2018, that's um, when Andy from, from the Gulf Marine Research Institute was calculating this. This is where he expected 2018 to be another heat wave year. And you can see the, the really warm temperatures in the Gulf of Maine. And here's another. Um, this is again the daily sea surface temperature anomaly, so the difference from what you would be expected. And this is for one day in early August, which turned out to be the second warmest day ever recorded for um, the Gulf of Maine region. It's just really warm. You see this really warm water um, all throughout the northwest Atlantic as well. So I just want to show you this year, 2019, just so you, as a, you know, what's happening this year. So you can see, it's pretty average, the beginning of the year, actually a little slightly cooler in the spring, pretty average, and this is kind of what you typically would expect, just sort of oscillating around average, starting to warm up a little bit, we've had some warm weather, but it's more of a normal year. Some of the buoys down south, we have one off of um, Massachusetts Bay, and that's showing some uh, now temperatures that are kind of at the upper level. So they might be getting a slight uh, marine heat wave down there. But so far, right now, um, for at least for this buoy, it's a fairly average year. 
So what were the causes of those marine heat waves? And you know, talking to the scientists that are looking into this, uh, overall, and generally, I think it's a combination of some major changes in the circulation patterns in the North Atlantic Ocean, along with the warming of the atmosphere. But here we are, and here's the Gulf of Maine right here. And offshore, and I talked about the Northeast Channel, which is right there, where a lot of this deep water comes into the Gulf of Maine. And there's two major sources of water that can come in there. There's this Labrador slope water, which is cold water, coming down from Canada, which typically brings in cold water. But you can also have this warmer slope water. This is deep water. There's also the Gulf Stream out here. What, um, they think may be happening is with the warming of the climate. There, up in Greenland, there's a lot of um, ice melting, um, putting a lot of fresh water into the ocean. So the water becomes more fresh, less um, salty. And that fresh water doesn't sink as fast as salt water does because it's less dense. And so um, that's slowing down the movement of this cold water here. And so it allows more, maybe, of this warm water, even some of this Gulf Stream water, to get into the Gulf of Maine. And the Gulf of Maine is kind of like a bathtub. You have George's Bank right here. Um, you know, it's sort of like a, a bathtub. And what they say is happening is maybe we're kind of turning off the cold water a little bit, letting more warm water in, and that's heating up the Gulf of Maine. And then we have a warming atmosphere, which also is contributing to it too. So that's what they think may be causing these marine heat waves and the, the warming of the Gulf of Maine um, that we've seen over the last decade. What are the consequences of this warming? Well, um, this warming is affecting you know, the whole ecosystem and it's been well documented. There's lots of stories and I've got a couple of examples. This is an article from uh, 2013 where warm ocean waters worry the main lobster main industry. Well, there was that uh, marine heat wave in 2012 that caused the lobsters to shed early. A uh, lot of fishermen weren't ready for it. The market wasn't ready for it. The price of the lobsters dropped. It really economically impacted the fishermen. Uh, they worried about it happening again. Fortunately, now they know this can happen. They've, they're a little better prepared for it. The, the, the market is, the processors are. Um, but uh, it, it had a big impact in 2012. And, and here's this other story. Regulators, this is from 2018. Regulators close Maine shrimp fishery for the next three years. Maine fishermen used to catch millions of pounds of shrimp everywhere, but the fishery is decimated by warming ocean temperatures. So these Maine shrimp, really tasty. <laughs> um, they are, they kind of live at the southern edge of their boundary here in the Gulf of Maine. So just the slight warming really affects them. And so the, the warming that we have has really impacted their population. There's just not that many out there. The managers that, um, you know, monitor this have just decided they, they can't allow them to be fished in hopes that, you know, um, that uh, they'll recover somewhat. But I think if, if it keeps warming, this is a fishery we may lose in the Gulf of Maine. Do, do the shrimp then head northeast? Or? Yeah, well, there's already there's populations of these shrimp in the Gulf of Maine, but there's also populations of them um, up off of Canada. And it's cooler up there, so that those populations will survive. It's just, there'll, there'll probably be some here, but not probably enough that they can have a fishery where um, a fishermen can catch millions of them. Isn't that what's happening to our lobsters now? The lobsters, and yes, the, the, I was going to mention, sir, there's also a, in 2018 a report that talked about a lot of different species. The lobsters, there used to be a pretty strong lobster fishery in Long Island Sound, off of Rhode Island. Not anymore. Probably warming temperatures. There's been some people have said there were pesticides to blame, but probably, probably warming temperatures. It hasn't warmed up enough that it's impacted the lobsters. Well, I shouldn't say that. Um, it, some, some scientists say it has impacted the lobster. And what happened is the lobsters are starting to move up the coast. And now the 
where the most lobsters are being caught are up around Stonington, that area. And they think that lobsters are sort of migrating up there. And so it hasn't gotten that cold for them. But if it keeps warming, that's what they think, though, the lobsters will migrate up the coast. We still have really high catches. There's still a lot of lobsters out there. But I'm also reading stories now that they, they do surveys to look for the juvenile lobsters, the small ones, to see they're finding less of those. Now, they're just not sure if they're finding less of those because the, the small ones are going somewhere else or that there's just less young ones, which, you know, takes, I think, six, seven, eight years when we get to market size. Um, we might see a decline. But we have new species that are coming in because the water's warmer now, so there's a, a black sea bass, which is typically thought of as a more southern species, coming in the Gulf of Maine, you're thinking about, and maybe that would be a new fishery. Um, we have these invasive green crabs along the coast. Um, they've been around for a long time. Typically, the population is held in check by the really cold winters. We've had some relatively warm winters, and the populations of these green crabs can explode. They can really decimate clam flats. They really go after baby clams or chew up salt marshes. So they can be really destructive. Um, so, Lots of changes, and even more, even more recent study. Um, just I think this came out in the spring. The scientists were able to link the warming of the Gulf of Maine to the decline in right whale's food supply. So the right whale is an endangered species. There's only about 400 of the whales left. I think they were heavily hunted. Um, they typically come up into the Gulf of Maine to feed. They're feeding on zooplankton colonists, which are just really lipid rich, a really good food supply for them. But the warming of the waters has, you know, changed the environment for these colonists. And so the colonists have moved. And so the whales are going to try to find where the colonists are. And some of them, many of them have gone out of the Gulf of Maine. And I think it was two years ago, a lot of them went up to the Gulf of St. Lawrence. Actually, um, several of the right whales died up there because they got entangled in crab traps up there. So um, we're seeing impacts, you know, from the smallest creatures all the way up to the whales, and obviously it's also having an economic impact. So the um, Gulf of Maine is definitely changing. I know that a lot of the fishermen, the men, <coughs> the scientists are trying to understand what's happening, and so that they can prepare for it, because uh, a lot of livelihoods depend on what's happening. Out there. And I think that's. Just kind of my closing, closing thoughts were, you know, that here in the Northeast, we were impacted by some pretty severe marine storms. As we just talked about, the Gulf of Maine is warming, warming faster in the last decade than 99% of the world's ocean. Um, at Neracruz, we what we want to do is support the collection of data so that we can understand, scientists can understand what's changing, hopefully help us prepare better for weather events like nor'easters and really understand how, what, what the changes are happening so we can be better prepared for those. And that is the end of my presentation. I'm happy to take any, any more questions.